an evolving African continental free trade area that created the largest free trade area, one of the largest free trade areas in the world, measured by the number of countries participating. So today we're going to be discussing what we can expect to come out of this summit in the area of agriculture and what needs on the ground are there that need to be met, which the partnership can address. Now before we get started, we're first going to show you a video hearing from some farmers in Africa about what they have to say. Les défis à relever en aquaculture sont nombreux. On a surtout le problème du changement climatique, les problèmes d'accès aux intrants et très souvent les problèmes de commercialisation de nos produits. Nous avons une sécheresse. C'est vrai que dans le Rarba, elle est un petit peu moins accentuée que partout ailleurs au Maroc, mais elle est là et nous impacte et elle impacte, elle impacte aussi nos rendements. The climate gets more difficult to farm due to climate change. There's been an increase in different pests and diseases, and this is a really real challenge for me as a farmer. But when it comes to the agricultural issues, like I suppose most farmers in the world, most important to me is soil health. And we are all working very hard to ensure that we invest enough in that which is very literally at the bottom of everything we do, good soils. Um, one of the ch um, opportunities um, is um, the introduction of better products, um, integrated pest management, and a lot of training for farmers to be able to adapt some of these practices. It's important that both the EU and the AU realize that we will not be able to feed two billion more mouths on this planet if we do not unlock the wealth in, of the agricultural potential of Africa. J'aimerais aussi demander à l'Union africaine et à l'Union européenne de pouvoir nous venir en aide à travers des formations, à travers des mises en contact avec d'autres personnes du secteur dans le monde, faciliter l'accès des intrants pour une production optimale. Il faut dire que l'Union européenne et l'Union africaine donnent les moyens aux planteurs de faire des transformations locales, ce qui permet de faire rester sur place des valeurs ajoutées, de créer de l'emploi et de permettre une certaine émergence. Ces dernières années, on a commencé à noter, euh, à noter que euh, qu'on a commencé un petit peu à enlever les matières actives du marché. Euh, ces molécules dites nocives euh, ne peuvent être enlevées si on ne trouve pas d'alternative. Euh, cela va impacter automatiquement les rendements. Mais ça a so there you have it, straight from the mouths of farmers in Africa, what they are concerned about right now. And one of the voices in that video is our keynote speaker for today, Theo de Jager. He is president of the World Farmers Organization. Theo, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. 
I'm particularly grateful that um, the Voice of Farmers has been involved in this discussion between the EU and the AU on partnerships. And that agriculture and our food systems play such an important role in this partnership. Because everything in agriculture today is about competitiveness. The world has become an extremely small place for farmers. Every farmer is every day in competition with the best other farmers in the world. And food and fiber and all our other products find their way across borders, across continents, and across the world. But the playing field is not level. And with the lack of harmonization in standards, in subsidies, in public support to agriculture, and in access to markets, the competitiveness of especially the African farmers are particularly hampered. Of course, competitiveness is very much dictated by the latest technologies. And the farmers cannot keep up with the cutting edge of new technologies, and especially in this digital era, they pay in when it comes to competitiveness. Now, farmers tend to learn more from other farmers than from anyone else. And what we wish for in the AU-EU partnership is for more farmer-to-farmer -farmer engagement, technology transfer, and knowledge transfer. We hope, we really wish that the partnership would actually boil down to more farmer-to-farmer -to -farmer partnerships too, to create a better awareness, but also better comprehension amongst farmers for the competition. We do not all provide in the same markets. Our markets differ vastly. There are those markets where the consumer wants to know where did this product come from and how was it produced? What was sprayed on it? How was this pig treated before he was slaughtered? A larger part of the market, especially in Africa, simply demand a nutritious meal three times a day. They want a proper balance in the mix on the plate. But a way too big part of the market simply wants affordability. And this affordability very often is an impediment to climate change, biodiversity and nature. Now, no one is as vulnerable to climate change as the world's farmers are. And we know in Africa that no one can do more about it in a short space of time than the world's farmers can. But we need to do that in a partnership with those farmers who have better access to technologies and to scientists and, of course, to data than we have. It has been said earlier today that our production systems are pretty much dominated by smallholder farmers. And we have no ambition in Africa to remain smallholder farmers in the current paradigm. We see ourselves as the agents for modernization, commercialization, mechanization, digitalization of agriculture, because agriculture is a business and a business must be profitable. And for that, we need to be competitive. European farmers is pretty well organized when it comes to cooperatives and advocacy groups. And it's not only the hardware of technology, which we need to learn from them. It is also the software, such as how do we organize ourselves? And from our side, we believe we have, in terms of indigenous knowledge and experience on the African continent, also a lot to share on that side of the ocean. Of course, governance is key to the organization of farmers. And we hope that eventually this partnership will boil down to more proper governance on both sides. Without that, we are going nowhere with the organizations of farmers. 
And with our farmers' organizations, we do not have a legitimate voice for farmers at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Theo, a lot for us to digest there as we go through the panel. So I'd like to introduce our panelists next, uh, who will be uh, called up on the screen here. So first off, we have John Clark. John is Director for International Issues at the EU Commission's Agriculture Department. We have Godfrey Bahigua, uh, uh, Director for Agriculture and Rural Development at the African Union Commission. We have German center-left MEP Joachim Schuster, Vice Chair of the European Parliament's Delegation for Relations with South Africa. We have Timothy Njagi, Research Fellow and Development Economist at the Tegamio Institute of Agricultural Policy and Development at Egerton University. We have David Ndegwa, a farmer from Kenya. And we have Samira Amalal, Director General for Crop Life Africa, Middle East. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we get into the discussion, let me tell you at home a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, if you want to join the discussion on social media, feel free to use the EA Debates hashtag right there below me. And uh, if you want to ask the panelists a question yourself, you can do that by typing your questions uh, into Slido. And I will be reading out your questions to the panelists later on in the panel. So, John, let me start with a question for you. When it comes to the European Commission, what is the Commission envis envisioning for a renewed EU-Africa partnership, specifically when it comes to agri-food? Thank, thank you for the question, Dave. And I must say, I was very impressed by uh, uh, Taylor Jager's uh, opening remarks. I think for better or worse, and I use that phrase advisedly, uh, the agricultural sector is going to remain a key sector in Africa in terms of its contribution to the economy, uh, job creation and food security. Um, the figures and demographics, however, are currently rather sobering. Uh, by 2050, the population will be 2.5 billion, almost a quarter of the planet. And, and despite growing urbanization, the rural population will actually increase across Africa. So unless there's a massive increase in uh, productivity, uh, reliance on imports will increase and food insecurity will also increase. So it's a very big challenge. Now, the EU cannot by itself uh, remedy the situation. Uh, that would be uh, neo-colonialist to try to think, think we could. But we can, uh, as, a, as a partner to Africa, uh, help in certain ways to improve the uh, sustainable productivity uh, in agriculture across the continent. And we're trying to do that in several ways. First of all, through our development cooperation and, and funding, including the European Investment Package, which will be launched at the summit uh, later this week. Uh, among other things, that will provide uh, 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 support for the building of hard infrastructure in Africa to support the agri-food sector, notably uh, energy supply, IT networks, and road and rail transport, the absence of which in many parts of Africa really impedes agri-food production and, and trade. And, and in addition, uh, and to the extent requested by African countries, um, the, the investment package will focus on the accelerating the green transition, uh, modernizing and making agriculture more sustainable, with a big focus on uh, women and smallholders and uh, moving up the value chain. And as uh, Taylor Diego said, um, you know, we, we uh, want to uh, empower smallholders to become more, more professional uh, through, through training, through the creation of cooperatives and, and, and so on. The second thing that we are doing in partnership with Africa is the uh, policy dialogue at ministerial level between European and African agriculture ministers. And that's already led to some change on the ground. For example, the setting up of agribusiness platforms to encourage European uh, companies to invest in, in the, very, uh, the very high potential of African agribusiness and produce locally. And secondly, the establishment of a pan-African strategy for geographical indications uh, about it's all about moving up the, the value chain and decommoditizing uh, agricultural production. And thirdly, um, uh, vocational ed educational training and farmers exchanges. And the third broad area of our support uh, is on the uh, our, our support for the development of the African continental free trade area. If Africa is going to feed itself and be less re reliant on imports, um, it needs to be able to produce and trade 
agri-food both regionally and across the continent in an integrated market without uh, barriers. The aim should be that a product uh, placed on the market in, say, Morocco could be free to be marketed in, in Mozambique or Mali. And we, of course, have a lot of experience on this based on our own integrated single market. And the economic partnership agreements we have with many African regions are both the, I'd say, the blueprint and the building block for that continental integration in Africa. And of course, we already offer African countries almost completely duty and quota free access to our own market, which they'll be able to take a more advantage of in the future uh, once they've got a higher productivity, can add value to their production and have the infrastructure in place to meet our standards. So I think we have a comprehensive plan for cooperation with Africa in agriculture and food, which will improve the continent's food security and prosperity in a sustainable way. And the summit will uh, launch many of these initiatives uh, in the agri-food agri sector, as you mentioned, Dave, at the beginning. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. Let me turn next to Joachim Schuster from the European Parliament. Tell me, what do you think about what we've achieved so far? How would you assess EU-Africa agri agri agri-food partnerships thus far, and how does that inform where we're going to now? Yes, uh, thank you, Dave. I want to uh, uh, especially mention uh, the aspect of trade, because I think trade is very important in this uh, context. Agri-food uh, partnerships mean, by my point of view, uh, that we want to reach food security. That is, that all people have enough food throughout the year without being dependent on aid programs. We are still a long way from that. And I believe in some way uh, that our mutual trade in agricultural products also contributes to that. Trade certainly contributes to the fact that smallholder agriculture is coming under pressure in many African countries. Resources, especially water, are sometimes used in an irrational way. Uh, for example, the cultivation of flowers in Kenya to export them uh, to Europe. Uh, it's a waste of water. Uh, and in many area, areas, African states only supply simple raw products. The value-intensive uh, processing uh, uh, takes place then in uh, uh, Europe. That's a great problem uh, for creating jobs uh, in African states. And uh, 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 European agriculture exports uh, put African products under considerable pressure because European producers often work much more productively and they get uh, 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 subsidies. In addition, the cultivation of exportable agricultural goods sometimes lead to monocultures cultures in African countries, which is ecological, uh, unsustainable, especially in the context of climate change. And therefore, I think Afri-Food partnerships are only beneficial if these negative effects uh, of mutual trade in agricultural products are eliminated and the development of social and ecological uh, agriculture in Africa is promoted. Therefore, I think uh, one aspect of Agri-Food uh, partnerships should be the adaption of our uh, trade agreements with African regions and sometimes with African states. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let's turn to Timothy next. Timothy, how well would you assess EU-Africa agri-food partnerships having worked so far? And do you think they've taken into account the realities on the ground in Africa? What, what could be improved? Thanks, Dave. Um, currently, as you look at the EU-Africa agri-food partnerships, we think that um, uh, to a large extent, they have ignored some of the key realities uh, that African farmers face. Uh, one of the things that we need to highlight is that uh, a, a reason, for example, for low productivity, uh, I think as Theo correctly mentioned, is that uh, there is less adoption of uh, uh, technology and, and knowledge uh, in production. And uh, this, of course, uh, constrains uh, the attainment of, of uh, yields. The, the key thing is that when you look at uh, uh, Africa, uh, I, I think as both uh, uh, the, uh, the, the other speakers mentioned, is that we are currently net uh, food importers. 
Uh, and that means that we really have to drive our productivity growth for us to be able to attain food security. Uh, uh, secondly, is that agriculture in Kenya is not just about uh, providing food, but it's also a source of income. So in terms of how we structure this and how we improve uh, the negotiations between EU and Africa going forward, we need to acknowledge that uh, it's a source of livelihood, uh, it is a source of food. And um, in terms of uh, trying to improve, especially on trade, uh, again, as uh, the, the, late, uh, the last speaker mentioned, is that we cannot compete with uh, farmers in Europe, uh, mainly because they enjoy uh, efficiency and subsidies that African farmers don't enjoy. So even as we think about trade and how to facilitate trade, uh, we have to take that into account uh, to try and uh, ensure that uh, Africa is able to feed itself. So among the key things that would reinforce is that, uh, for example, the provisions in the, in the Green Deal uh, would actually lead to adverse effects um and um you know would not necessarily this although not intended uh, as a result of the deal there are a lot of uh, unintended adverse unintended effects especially in terms of reducing uh, both productivity and production and uh, attaining food security thank you thanks timothy david let's turn to you next how well would you say these partnerships are taking into account the realities on the ground uh, thank you, David, and uh, thank you, John and Theo Timothy, for your beautiful presentation. Um, as I said, I'm a practicing farmer in, uh, in Kenya, uh, mainly doing uh, cattle growing um, for European markets, mainly tiger sale and uh, French beans. Um, and when I talk, I join the other farmers who are expressing their feelings and uh, what they go through uh, when they are farming in Africa. Farming in Africa is not a walk in the park. It's actually uh, full of challenges. And uh, about 98% of uh, farming, especially in Kenya, is uh, rain fed. Rain fed means that uh, it has to really and fully rely on the rainfall, which uh, over a period of time due to climate change has witnessed uh, depressed rainfall. Uh, and uh, sometimes the rainfall is not sufficient to support growth, uh, crop growth. All when it comes, it comes in uh, high intensity within a very short time of period, which which uh, leads to crop failure in some areas. There are very few areas that uh, one can plant in Kenya and say that 100% uh, will be able to uh, harvest the crop. So what happens is that uh, we've seen low production per unit area uh, caused by depressed rainfall. And um, the way to address this uh, climate change, and uh, because what happens is that inadequacy of water or insufficiency of water leads to crop failure. So um, one thing that needs to be addressed is the issue of, of climate change can be uh, countered by uh, harvesting water. Because in Kenya, when they talk about Kenya, we do not suffer from water sickness. Scarcity, we suffer from uh, inability to harvest the rains that the rainfall, the rainwater that uh, comes and, and uh, disappears to the ocean. So, if uh, dams are constructed to ensure that um, the, we, we increase the, pro, the proportion between rain fed and irrigated agriculture, which is now standing in about 2% of the entire agricultural production in Kenya. That one would, would actually go a long way in ensuring that that issue has been addressed. Um, as Timothy said, agriculture in Kenya is uh, both a uh, food production uh, activity and also a source of income. What normally happens uh, when 98% percent of agriculture is hundred percent, ninety percent is relying on rainfall. There is a uh, Flat at the time of uh, a certain period of time when the rainfall um, is, is adequate, which also leads to another problem of storage because uh, there are no sufficient storages uh, in, in Kenya. And that is one area that needs to be looked into in terms of funding and, and financing to ensure that uh, there is adequate storage. Because when there is no storage, especially the perishable 
products or even non-perishable um, they go into waste because of uh, attack to pest, pest like we was in case of maize. Then we have other issues like pests and diseases. Uh, we are having challenges because Africa falls under the tropics. The temperatures remains high and uh, this leads to high growth of uh, pests and diseases, which remains unchecked. And um, uh, we need to have enough molecules to ensure that um, that one is, uh, I mean, the control is taken care of. What normally happens is that uh, we have seen uh, incidents whereby uh, products are withdrawn without uh, us being given alternative or sufficient notice to be able to address uh, uh, those factors. Then you find that uh, especially uh, people growing for export, um, the demand for quality is very high uh, such that any port that has has a blemish uh, with uh, uh, with or caterpillar damage or a very slight trip damage may not be suitable for export simply because the consumer in Europe uh, will not be able to can't buy such a product. I think also <clears throat> we need to as we advocate for reduction of pesticides, uh, we also need to create awareness to the consumers that. Uh, a, a pod that is bent, straightly bent, or a curved pod, a French bean curved pod, <coughs> tastes the same way uh, the straight one tastes. And also, when you cook the straight one, it's also uh, kink and, and curves, so it doesn't remain straight all the way to the stomach. So we need to, we are having problems of wastage when it comes to meeting stringent quality parameters that are dictated. If, if a reduction in pest rate could also go into creating awareness to the consumers that uh, they do not have to, they do not have get any prop, uh, stomach upset by eating um, uh, a, a French bean pot that, is, that has a, a weed breeze. The other, the other issue is uh, also, um, as we, we, we recognize and we appreciate that uh, of, of about 90% of farming in, in Africa falls under small scale holders. But this is not the main problem. Actually, for the time that I've been in, uh, in, um, in, in this in farming, I've seen small scale growers producing better quality produce than large scale because they are able to take good care of, of, of the small scale. What is lacking is actually the, the information flow, whereby I still say that farmers learn from other farmers. What happens is that uh, it's good to learn from when farmers are learning from other farmers' experience, but sometimes it happens that farmers also learn bad experience or what they would assume as good agricultural practices from farmers who have not been or have not been equipped or informed properly. So lack of extension in Kenya, and I would say to a large extent in Africa, uh, is a major problem because the information that needs to go into to, to the farmers for them to be able to uh, use the right, uh, let's say fertilizer, uh, use the right uh, spacing, um, the right chemicals, is actually lacking. And, um, I would say the coverage, although this is not from uh, any data and has been on the ground, and I talk to the farmers, and many farmers do not have access to extension. So lack of information, and every um, it's unfortunate that sometimes farming is is not given a regard as other professions, whereby you see like uh, when it comes to engineering, where measures are well uh, enhanced or followed, you find that in farming, uh, the spacing, the, 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 the crop uh, population per unit area is actually never given any credibility or is not given the weight that it's supposed to, to carry. And these are the small factors that lead to uh, 
increased production per unit area because what I've seen in Kenya mainly is that farmers are not able to get what or the target yields per unit area. And then when you fail to do that, you end up having or producing a kg of whatever you produce at a higher cost. So when it comes to selling, you are unable to sell because you've already sold or grown your, your crop at a higher price than the market is offering. Then when a, such a farmer doesn't realize profit, then the following season he changes to another crop or he doesn't do uh, Thanks, David. Or from farming. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. So let's go next to Samira. Samira, tell me, how do you think that these partnerships have worked so far? And what would you say needs to be improved? Thank you, Dave. So <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be speaking here as an African woman on behalf of Crop Life Africa Middle East, representing seven international R&D crop protection companies and 22 national associations. And then the new partnership is an opportunity to take the partnership in agriculture to the next level and improve our food system. And here in is how, on my view, the partnership can achieve a sustainable green transition in agriculture in a way that works for the both continents. First, an impact assessment of policy proposal should be conducted. Both parties are striving to achieve United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but Policies suited to the needs of the one will not necessarily to be suited to that of the other. Talking about limiting access to crop protection in a continent where most farmers don't use agrochemical does not resonate with the local reality. Second, farmers' access to the necessary technologies need to be improved as does their access to training. We as Crop Life AME are training farmers across Africa and together we can reach even more farmers. Third, and very important, we must allow Africa to trade rather than being left dependent on the aid. Farmers in Africa are asking for improved market access to the Europe and concerns from parties, including government from many nations worldwide about Europe approach to market access and adherence to international agri-food trading standards. Four, illicit and counterfeit products or inputs must be removed from the market. The circulation of these inputs and products pose a risk to our health and to our environment. I think that an operation similar to the Operation Silver Axe, um, supported by Europol, should be introduced to our continent. Also, the partnership must support the transition towards a circular economy and be complemented with the national programs for responsible waste management. As an industry in Africa and Middle East, we are recycling empty containers that help in cut emissions and support the transition towards a circular economy. And let's do more together. Finally, the partnership must be output focused. The policy conversation seems to focus on inputs, but we need to be more output driven and improved results in the state of our environment, improved food security, improved progress in achieving UN Sustainable Development Goal. This is how it's looked the, 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 the partnership between Africa and Europe. To conclude, let's see, Crop Life Africa Middle East motto is partner in sustainable agriculture. As an industry, we stand ready to support the implementation of a localized green transition in Africa. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Samira. Now, just a quick uh, programming note. Unfortunately, Godfrey Bahigwa from the African Union Commission will be unable to join us today. Uh, so, uh, Joachim, I wanted to go back to something you said uh, in the opening there, that you were talking about trade and, and that trade is a pretty important element of this. So how do you expect that the newly established African continental free trade area will impact these partnerships, specifically uh, when it comes to agri-food? Do you expect it will have a big impact? Yes, I think it will have an Im impact. But uh, first, we have uh, to mention that the, the African free trade area is more an objective at the moment. There's a lot to do uh, to reach this goal. Uh, uh, and I think there 
It aims to strengthen intra-African trade and uh, to strengthen regional uh, value-added uh, uh, structures. And I think there is a good chance for regional uh, 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 partnerships uh, in agri-food uh, uh, agri partnerships because I think they can support uh, uh, the way uh, um, uh, such an uh, it can be a stepping uh, stone for this. Uh, uh, not a stepping stone. They can be uh, can support this um, uh, uh, African continental free trade area. Uh, but I think uh, this would also uh, require the correcting of the undesirable developments that I've mentioned in the connection with European and African agricultural trade. Uh, but uh, because if we have no uh, 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 correction, then uh, we have the problem that uh, 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 the level playing field uh, between Africa and Europe is uh, uh, not there because uh, I mentioned it before, the European agriculture industry is much more productive. They get subsidies. And therefore, we uh, have in some way also to protect uh, uh, the African um, uh, agriculture industry and especially to uh, facilitate uh, the large scale producers because it's very important that they uh, pro uh, have a profit from uh, this uh, development. Thanks a lot. John, same question to you. How do you expect this new trade area to impact particularly the, the agricultural partnerships that uh, will continue to exist going forward between the EU and Africa? Well, as has been um, implied by, by some of the speakers, um, <clears throat> the, the African market is very uh, fragmented. Um, we don't really have a functional regional integration in the African regions, let alone a continent-wide uh, free trade area yet. Now, of course, the, 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 the new uh, African continental free trade area, free trade area will, will help because it will, it will remove uh, tariffs um, on most trade uh, flowing between African countries, although there'll, there'll, there'll still be quite a lot of exceptions, uh, notably in, in the agricultural sector, which is quite sensitive. Um, but it will, it will help to um, um, create uh, the beginnings of more um, integrated regional value chains. But it, it, it won't go far enough. Um, in order to have a, a, a genuinely uh, continent-wide um, uh, trade regime, if you like, a, a, you, need a, you need a single market. Um, and that means going beyond tariffs and actually tackling at the continental level um, a lot of the uh, non-tariff barriers that, that frustrate um, uh, continental uh, agricultural trade. I'm talking about um, uh, customs and border procedures. I'm talking about the, um, the lack of a harmonized um, uh, SPS system across Africa. And we're working with the African Union to try to um, help develop in Africa a, a continent-wide uh, food safety uh, regime. Uh, without these things and without um, improvements to the continent's um, hard infrastructure, uh, the the uh, the impact of a, of a of a simply a free trade area with with just tariff reduction uh, will will not go go far enough. Uh, I, I certainly agree with the last uh, speaker, Joachim Schuster, that um, the the regional agreements that we have with Africa, um, where we are uh, working with different African regions. To, to, to encourage their integration as a region, as opposed to you know, eight or 10 different countries, that, that is a very important uh, building block uh, towards the, uh, the continental free trade area that we are looking forward to see. Timothy, same question to you. How do you expect these, these changes in free trade will affect, uh, will affect these types of partnerships? <laughs> So, so to begin with, uh, one of the things that we, we realize uh, is that for Africa to be able to effectively participate in markets is that we have to be competitive. Um, one of the challenges, of course, that we are facing right now has been the issue of uh, being able to, to be competitive. And even as we, force, as we think of 
uh, this uh, Africa taking effect and we have an integrated market. I think, uh, as, as Clark mentioned, is that you know, tariff loans will not necessarily solve the deal, but it also has to make sense uh, for goods to be able to move from one region to the other. Uh, one of the ways we need to do that, of course, is to encourage specialization, uh, as well as uh, seeing how we can improve production efficiencies so that we can lower uh, uh, the cost uh, of producing uh, these commodities. This, again, will rely on us being able to adapt technologies uh, as well as accessing um, um, you know, markets for some of the niche products that we, we do produce. And uh, I can give an example in the case of Kenya. Uh, uh, the European market is a, is, a, is a niche market for some of the horticultural produce that we do produce. And you find that uh, farmers are able to competitively uh, produce and be able to sell to that market. Uh, but then the same produce, if they were to sell it in the local market, uh, although it's high quality, probably it wouldn't be that competitive because very few people would be able to afford. So even as we, as we are trying to tie this down, um, at the heart of it, again, is that the African consumer must be able to uh, uh, um, afford whatever we are providing for them uh, from the different regions in Africa. Uh, it's good that we should be able to actually allow uh, or look at Africa as, as a common market. Uh, but still, even as you're doing that, we really must promote uh, productivity um, uh, related interventions so that we can uh, produce competitively. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Timothy. I wanted to ask you all also about technology and the role that technology is going to play here in these partnerships going forward, but also especially in the sustainable transition. Samira, how do you think that um, technology is going to, to affect these changes? And how can we really unlock the potential of sustainable technologies in particular? Yeah, thank you for the question. Look, here's an exciting time for Africa. To unlock sustainable transformation, we need to strengthen institutions. We need to enable environment for agribusiness and increase investment to accelerate agricultural transformation. Africa requires implementation of regulatory reform adapted to its environment. We need to offer opportunity to smallholder farmers for prosperity and for healthy future. And the tools that we, the farmers or smallholder farmers need to be resilient and also competitive and uh, to be facing of all the challenges, uh, including climate change. First of all, is access to, to, to technologies, um, including uh, organic and synthetic pesticide. Need to access to training and enable policy forum work. So for me to um, a partnership around this, um, uh, these points can really uh, empower smallholder farmers and unlock the sustainable transformation in Africa. Especially, and uh, or in addition on, and also it can be uh, an addition of what the um, colleagues said about trade, farmers are, and smallholder farmers are faced barrier to market entrance. So by removing this entry of Africa barrier, trade will better enable to access to innovation, we can also uh, be enabled to improve uh, transfer uh, technology between nations and uh, potentially reduce the carbon footprint of the agriculture industry. So by removing this um, barrier, um, the intra Africa trade, we can also make it more easier to produce, to access to uh, technologies, to supply and source from and within Africa. Thank you. Thanks a lot. David, uh, as a farmer, how do you think that these technologies can, we can make sure that they're available to all farmers and that we can really facilitate their use, uh, particularly from your perspective coming from Kenya? Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, areas whereby technology can be passed is the farmer and improvement on production is the enhancement of uh, extension or training where a farmer would be trained on uh, improved agricultural practices. And um, the other thing about uh, um, when you come to Africa continent uh, free trade areas, uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, I feel the, the government, and I would say African governments, needs to create more awareness 
to ensure that their citizens um, knows about these things because I'm sure there are quite a number of people who do not even understand and don't know whether they exist, despite the fact that they were, I think they were started in 2018 and um, most of people or the players or, or the actors do not know about them. So as you said, extension plays a very a key role in terms of enhancing technology adopt, adoption in the farm market, especially the smallholders. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, John, same question for you. When, when you're looking at these international partnerships, what is the role of technology there? And how do you make sure that the partnerships are facilitating uptake of technology that can improve sustainability? Well, we're, we're all engaged in not only a, a green transition, but a, a digital transition, uh, both in Europe and, and uh, with our partners, and in particular, uh, Africa, who is a priority. So it's very clear that, um, that the future for a more productive agricultural sector in Africa, as in Europe, uh, depends on um, technology, uh, more digital solutions, uh, precision uh, farming. Um, and that can that will be the, the key, I, I would say, to achieving the, the holy grail of, of um, uh, helping the, the climate and the environment while at the same time increasing productivity. We need to do both. Um, we're coupling that with a, a very, very big push on research and in, in innovation uh, in, in farming. And our uh, flagship research project, Horizon Europe, uh, has, has devoted um, more than 1 billion euros to um, uh, looking at uh, ways to improve production sustainably uh, using innovative techniques. And, and they are available to Africa. Um, but I, I would also add that um, it's it's not only the public sector which uh, is going to be the the, the key to to um, providing more uh, technological solutions to African farming. Um, what we need to see, and we're starting to see it, but it's very patchy, I would say, is um, the the creation of of an, of, of, a, of an investment climate in Africa, which is attractive to European um, agri food business who, when they invest in African production, they bring with them um, modern technologies, techniques, um, not, uh, transfer of know-how, uh, training of farmers, um, uh, social innovation in terms of organizing farmers into uh, cooperatives and so on. And I think that, that aspect, um, um, the, the power of um, foreign direct investment from Europe into the African agri-food sector will be a very big vector for um, um, more high-tech solutions but not, and also solutions which can be accessible to um, small farmers. Thanks a lot. Joachim, I wanted to ask you about how we really localize some of these policies that we're talking about. Of course, taking into account that different localities, different parts of the world have different uh, requirements. Um, so when we're talking about how, how these sustainable agriculture issues are going to look in Europe, are they going to look the same in Africa? And are they going to look the same everywhere in Africa? Africa is obviously a very diverse place. Uh, how do you think that localization will look for Europe and Africa, particularly as we move ahead with these partnerships? Um, uh, uh, first, I want uh, to say something to the question of investment climate. I think uh, because John uh, mentioned it, Investment climate is very important, uh, of course, because we need also private investment uh, in Africa uh, to support uh, productive structures. But on the other side, at the same time, uh, we need uh, an increasing public uh, investment there because uh, often we have a lack of infrastructure, we have a lack of uh, 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 renewable energy there, and therefore we have also a lot of invest there. Uh, the, um, the states are asked uh, to increase their investment and there we need uh, something like an investment partnership between the European Union uh, and the, uh, the uh, African states. Uh, concerning uh, the question of localization, the, uh, um, uh, these partnerships, I think it's decisive uh, 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 that we include uh, uh, the smallholders farmers uh, uh, in the regions and we include uh, the civil society organizations 
uh, because then we can find uh, uh, solutions which are uh, fit uh, for uh, the problems uh, in the uh, uh, regions. Because the problems or the deficits or the potential of the different regions uh, are very different between the uh, African states. Africa is a huge country and the same would be in uh, Europe. Uh, uh, we have not one Europe. We have uh, different states in Europe and that we have different conditions. And therefore, we need in, uh, to include the people in the regions and the uh, organizations of the civil society. And then we can uh, find uh, the best solutions. Thanks a lot. Timothy, uh, Timothy, let me go to you next. When we're thinking about how to apply these different um, sustainability practices, different technologies, uh, how is it going to differ in Europe versus Africa? How is it going to differ within Africa in different types of uh, climates, different types of countries, different types of farming practices? Is, do you expect a, a big difference in how these things are localized and applied? <laughs> Uh, sh sure, Dave. I think um, I, I want to mention key technologies that have been mentioned, uh, for example, like the use of pesticides and the, as well as the use of fertilizers. Uh, Tegemeo, uh, the institute did a study uh, to look at the impact uh, that, for example, the withdrawal of pesticides would have uh, in Kenya. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we found was that uh, if you look at the proposed list that uh, that was initially being discussed locally, uh, as a result of the petition that have been launched uh, by the civil society organization was that um, uh, the adverse effect would be up to 16% loss of agricultural GDP. Yet, when you look at um, Kenya and compare, for example, to countries in the EU, Kenya we are using uh, about less than one kilogram per hectare uh, of pesticide. Uh, we are using about 30 kilograms uh, per hectare of fertilizer. Uh, in the EU, of course, you find that this is for pesticides about 10 kilograms per hectare, and for fertilizer is more than 100 kilos uh, per hectare. So you can actually see that the context differs significantly in terms of how we adapt some of these technologies, and um, we cannot actually be compared on the same wavelength because, you know, for us not to use some of these inputs. Uh, it would have significant adverse effects, not just on agricultural production, but uh, as well as livelihoods uh, for many of the people who rely uh, on agriculture. Thanks a lot. So let's go to, we've had a couple questions come in from the audience. I'd like to put uh, those questions to you guys. I'll start out with our first, mo most upvoted question. Uh, and John, I'm going to put this to you first. The question is from Fernando Souza. Uh, and so he says, uh, what about the need to revise the international trade agreements which force African states to be flooded by foreign agricultural products, very often from the EU and the USA, with which they cannot compete? This should be a number one priority. So John, I know this is something we hear from Africa quite often. How do you respond to that? Well, there's a lot of um, fake news about this, frankly. I'll be very blunt. Um, Africa is not flooded by European products. Um, African countries under WTO rules remain uh, absolutely free if they choose to, to block imports. Uh, they, they choose not to do so because um, Africa cannot today, unfortunately, feed itself. And very, there are very big urban populations uh, who need uh, protein, which cannot be found locally. And therefore, the governments in Africa have decided to um, uh, open their markets to some imports uh, from Europe or other countries to feed um, um, growing and, and increasingly um, uh, turbulent urban populations. But as I, as I said, under the WTO rules and under the, um, the arrangements of our uh, bilateral economic partnership agreements, uh, African countries are, are completely at liberty uh, not to import uh, European uh, milk powder or, or poultry. They choose not to do so. Um, Joaquim, same question to you. Do you agree that uh, the perceptions on this don't match reality? It differs between different states. Uh, in some states, we have real disputes about uh, uh, on the uh, European imports to, uh, in Africa. For example, uh, mostly with poultry, for example. And on the other side, we have uh, disputes on uh, citru citrus fruits. 
Um, I think uh, 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 we have to have a closer look to uh, the different regions and there we find uh, something, uh, uh, the problem that uh, uh, European exports uh, uh, are really not good for uh, the African states. Uh, but it differs between uh, the different uh, countries. And therefore, I think uh, 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 concerning the revision of the agreements, I think uh, more, it's more the problem that we mostly have more free trade agreements. Uh, we need to add some more chapters. We call it a Europe uh, Economic Partnership Agreements. But at the end, it's normally uh, they are uh, only free trade agreements. And uh, we have to add uh, investment partnerships, for example, uh, that we really increase uh, 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 investment and that we can help to uh, build up infrastructure uh, there, for example. We have uh, to stress uh, the problem aid for trade, uh, because often uh, it's a problem that uh, 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 the rules uh, for trade or the rule, SPS rules, uh, are not known uh, from uh, of the um, uh, African producers and therefore they have problems uh, to export something. And we have uh, uh, to add a, a partnership uh, to tackle, uh, for tackling climate change. Uh, that would be important. Uh, and therefore I think there is a need for a revision. Uh, sometimes it's necessary that we uh, uh, improve uh, uh, the provisions uh, that uh, African states can block some uh, kinds of export. Uh, but on the other side, we need new partnerships, uh, which I mentioned. Thank you. Samira, how do you respond to this type of concern that we, we hear in Africa? Again, we are coming here to discuss how we can also remove uh, the barrier intra trade in Africa. So we, we uh, just uh, to, to give you, according to the FAO statistics, sub-Saharan on loan spend more than $40 billion on food imports. So by removing this, this trade and enabling access to, to the yield, uh, increasing sustainability input, so potentially those billions can be used to buy from African farmers and fuel rural development. So the, the removing this intra-Africa trade barrier will better enable access to innovation and we can um, transfer of technologies and um, definitely the, this, the new partnership, um, as I said, so has um, to, 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 to support Africa trade um, rather than to being left dependent on the aid. So yeah, there is concern about also European approach uh, to market access and adherence to international agri-food uh, trading standard. So this is this is why it's very important that this new um, localized green transition to Africa needs to uh, to take in consideration the specificity of environment in Africa and the need of our farmers in our continent. Timothy, same question to you. Uh, how do you respond to these types of concerns coming out of Africa? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I want to agree with Samira that yeah, we need to uh, support actually the removal of trade barriers within Africa. But as I had mentioned earlier, that that alone will not be uh, the game changer because ultimately, uh, on the consumer side, they will be also be looking at the issue about affordability. So as you're looking towards uh, the partnership between Africa and the EU, we need to see how we can uh, uh, enhance uh, adoption of technologies that will allow us to improve our yields, allow us to be competitive and lower our cost uh, at the end of the day so that actually uh, the, the, the local producers or the producers in Africa uh, can actually be able to compete in this market. Uh, if we don't do that, of course, then we realize that although the market, they can access certain markets, you know, they'll be actually eventually be locked out because there'll be little demand for, for some of their products. So uh, the way we see it is that in hand with that, we need to also promote uh, you know, efficient production system, uh, ensure that uh, farmers get sufficient yields uh, at, at, at uh, lower cost. Uh, and um, that we then, you know, opening up the markets for them is that they can actually go into those markets and be able to compete, uh, even as you know, other other the, the tariff and non tariff barriers are addressed by uh, the Africa to free trade agreement. Thanks, Timothy. So, John, we have two questions that have come in for you. 
so the question, uh, see if we can go to Jennifer's or, or Joaquim. Joaquim, it would also be a question for you. Uh, so these, both of these questions come from, come from Cohn de Kaiser, uh, de Kaiser rather. The EU is debating to raise the sustainable standards on their food imports. How will it help African smallholders to meet these standards? Second question, many African countries have their own vision about sustainable food systems. What is the EU doing to align with different visions on food systems, on pesticide use, synthetic fertilizers, genetics of, uh, in African countries? The fear is that the EU will impose its own systems. John, how do you respond to those concerns? Well, I'll take the second question first. Of course, we, don't, we, we do not and cannot and would not wish to impose on, on any other country in the world, uh, uh, our own uh, system. Um, the, the reality, however, is that um, all countries in, in the recent United Nations Food Systems Summit um, uh, took on a number of um, commitments to, to improve the sustainability of their food system, all the way from the farm to the fork, from, from the farm gate to the, to the consumer. So we're all um, rowing in the same direction, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, Asia, the Americas, we're all moving in the same direction because we all realize that uh, the planet needs to have a more sustainable food system. We may have different uh, ways to get there, but the aims are, are all the same. So I think it's, it's, a, it's um, uh, not, not, a, not a, a, a problem in itself. On the first question, uh, yes, the EU is, um, is, is co constantly uh, raising its, um, its food standards. Uh, because there is an enormous consumer pressure to do so, and because we need to produce our food more sustainably uh, to use uh, fewer pesticides, uh, fewer fertilizers, um, and, and uh, make our production more, more environmentally uh, friendly. So yes, we, we are unashamedly raising our standards. Um, if that creates difficulties for African exporters who, who may find in the future that for a particular crop, uh, cocoa or coffee or bananas or tropical fruits, if that creates a dif difficulty, uh, we are there with our development uh, support uh, to, to ensure that uh, African farmers and the, the, the companies that, uh, that uh, are, are producing for the, for the European market uh, can meet those standards. And that's something that we are absolutely committed to doing. So Joaquin, same two questions for you. How do you respond to those concerns? Yeah, uh, uh, I would like only to add one uh, aspect. Uh, in Europe, we have a highly industrialized uh, uh, agriculture. And uh, it's a real problem for the climate. Uh, our agriculture, uh, uh, form of uh, agricultural production uh, uh, is a, an important driver for the climate change. And therefore, we have to raise real sustainability standards uh, not only because of consumer uh, pressure, but, uh, but also uh, because of the tackling climate change. It's responsible for more than 10% of the uh, 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 carbon gas emissions. The second thing is uh, we have to, uh, and that's uh, I mentioned before with uh, aid for trade, uh, we have to uh, uh, help also uh, African producers uh, uh, to uh, meet this uh, sustainability uh, standards. But on the other side, uh, a real sustainability uh, in agriculture often means that we have local production for local markets. It makes no sense uh, that we uh, uh, import tons of uh, uh, meat from America uh, to Europe and vice versa. And sometimes it's the same uh, uh, with uh, uh, other uh, regions because uh, this uh, uh, form of uh, we need uh, sustainable is uh, mainly a local production a regional production for regional and local markets and there we uh, have to uh, rebuild our agriculture systems uh, that i think is the main uh, uh, challenge uh, if we really want to tackling as a climate change uh, and sometimes it's uh, also a question uh, which products we really uh, cultivate in our thing. Cold, uh, products for the world market are often uh, different from uh, products of, uh, which we have to cultivate for local markets. Uh, but uh, local, uh, local 
products for local market, uh, markets are often uh, more adapted uh, to uh, climate change than uh, uh, tackling climate change than uh, global uh, products for global markets. And therefore, uh, for example, in, uh, in Europe, we have an Uh, we have to reduce our uh, meat production because it's uh, crazy uh, under um, uh, the aspects of climate change. David, how do you feel about this? Do you share these fears that the EU is going to impose uh, its own vision of sustainability on African farmers? Yes, to some extent, yes. Um, Although uh, John has said that um, EU does not uh, willingly impose uh, those standards to African, to Africa, I feel indirectly they do so because uh, of the requirement that uh, for you to export to from Africa to EU, you have to uh, adopt to certain standards. Like for example, we have global gap, which is uh, internationally acceptable, which is okay. But then as we move on, we uh, more and more standards are being uh, put in place that have to be met before somebody or an exporter exports to EU market. And uh, what normally happens, uh, although they could be well-meaning, what happens is that uh, because uh, the member countries in EU, uh, most of them are developed, well as most of the countries in Africa are developing, Uh, EU is able to grow even vegetables, especially horticultural crops, in restricted areas. And if, like in Africa, where they are uh, grown in open fields, where uh, pests and diseases uh, cannot be controlled in any other way apart from uh, chemical intervention. We are now moving from uh, safe use of pesticide to removal of molecules, <coughs> which is now becoming uh, quite a challenge to as farmers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, let me go to the next question. Actually, before I go to the next question, uh, Samira, let me put this, this question to you also. So do you, do you hear these types of concerns about um, you know, uh, the EU's vision on sustainability being imposed on African farmers? So there is, there is, I think, misunderstanding um, and also miscommunication about the European agenda to Africa. So, uh, and also there is the, uh, also the discussion around what, what is, um, uh, what's the, the European vision to Africa. Definitely, we feel uh, that there is need that uh, Europe can has to take in consideration um, uh, the Africa uh, environment, uh, the smallholders' needs. And uh, also the challenges that smallholder farmers include um, just producing enough uh, for their needs. And also pressure, and this is uh, pest pressure uh, different from uh, European farmer uh, has. So for example, uh, we had uh, attacks of fall army worm and desert locust plague that causes an increasing risk of food security and livelihood of over 300 million uh, people in Africa. So uh, this is very important that this uh, uh, renewed partnership Africa-Europe to uh, support um, uh, uh, localized green transition to our continent and also to be in alignment with the African Union Agenda 20, uh, 2063 goals and um, by the end help uh, supporting a green uh, transition to Africa. Well, I have a next question for Timothy. This question comes from Bridget Murphy. Uh, Bridget says, women are critical to the production and delivery of food in Africa. Empowerment and removals of barriers, governance, and transformation of systems all need the participation and input of women. How is gender mainstreaming built into the agenda discussed here today? Timothy? Uh, thank, <coughs> thank, thanks for that question. Uh, so as, as you've discussed, uh, correctly pointed out that uh, women play a key role in, in, in agriculture, not just providing labor, but also uh, deriving income and livelihood from uh, agricultural activities as well. So we <coughs> need to ensure that uh, 
uh, farmers especially, we are competitive and we can actually improve trade because then that kind of transforms us towards sustainable uh, commercialization of agriculture. Uh, this will mean that um, uh, women will be deriving more income, uh, especially where women have access to land and where women are in charge of uh, enterprises. And we've already seen examples even locally in Kenya where women uh, play a key role, uh, especially in terms of driving productivity growth uh, as a result of receiving targeted interventions, key among them uh, training and adoption of technologies uh, such as the use of improved seed, uh, use of fertilizer, as well as uh, uh, pest and uh, disease control uh, measures. As we, as we think about our trade uh, integration and uh, facilitation, I think it's also important to recognize that women also play a key role in agricultural markets. And uh, even by just increasing economic activity at, at the lower nodes of, of uh, agricultural value chain, uh, this has potentially uh, key economic benefits for women as well. Thank you. So the next question I'm going to put to John. Uh, so this question comes from Sarah Iwiala from the University of Göttingen. How will the increase in national due diligence laws, which are also discussed at EU level, affect supply chains and agricultural production in Africa? Will it move production away from countries with more problematic human rights situations, such as child labor and cocoa production, to other regions? John? Uh, I, I can't really uh, predict the, the, the future as... as uh, as much as Sarah would like me to, but um, I, I would expect that the um, the market will um, will adjust to these uh, changes, in in the sense that um, um, retailers and and companies importing um, from Africa commodities, uh, cocoa and others, um, as they as they exercise diligence through the supply chain, as they ensure that there is no uh, child labour. Involved in the in their in their sourcing uh, and other um, serious problems, uh, that will actually uh, make the uh, the sector more uh, attractive uh, to European consumers. Who, as I said earlier on in the in this um, panel debate, um, um, and it was also mentioned by Theodore Jager, uh, European consumers increasingly know want to know what is the uh, what is the environmental footprint of, the, of what they're consuming. What is the traceability of what they're consuming? Uh, have these products been produced in an ethical manner? And if the answer to those questions is yes, uh, that the product is sustainable, um, that commands a premium on the European market and consumers will go for it. So I think the, uh, the, the impact of, uh, of, of applying due diligence requirements uh, to African uh, suppliers uh, will, will actually have the, a very beneficial impact in, in uh, uh, allowing those suppliers to access the European market in the future. Timothy, for the African perspective on this, do you think that these national due diligence laws will shift production away from countries with more problematic human rights records? Um, uh, so for, for, for a start, I think um, when you look at uh, each, each, each of the countries in Africa and uh, the, the systems that have been put in place. Uh, we have several countries, and example being Kenya being one of them, uh, for example, that has a robust uh, regulatory environment for both, uh, for example, things like seed, uh, pesticide, um, fertilizer. And um, of course, we consider Kenya to be um, we've had, um, in the past, we've had issues on human rights record, but I think we've really come a long way, especially into trying and ensure that uh, we're able to protect um, uh, human rights as well as especially child labor, which used to be a key problem uh, in agriculture in the past. Uh, one of the, of course, the key, the key issues around here is the, the local context in the sense that, uh, uh, again, linked to a question that you had asked earlier about some of the fears that uh, local producers have, is that you know, the, the context here may be different in the sense that uh, uh, the, the, the key thing that farmers have a lot of fear on is um, whether some of the, the conditions or the regulations that are being uh, suggested uh, by the EU 
uh, if African farmers uh, hold uh, to those standards, then it unfairly uh, creates um, it creates an unfair environment for them uh, that has adverse effects you know, on uh, on the local impact because the view is that this does not necessarily reflect the local realities. Uh, but the key thing is that we need also to make sure that you know, like African governments are encouraged as much as possible to adhere to you know internationalist standards. So basically, uh, yes, the fear is that um, yeah, we we are likely to see um uh, a shift especially uh, and we can also mention uh the, like the emerging issues in africa such as the land grabs where you know land is being uh, given to uh, big uh, foreign uh, institutions or, or or countries to produce in africa uh, that has been a key concern and it's likely that uh, uh, they are more likely to be able to produce such standards uh, of course at the detriment of the local um, population so some of those fears could be could be could be well founded uh, but i think what we need also to ensure that is that we continue to encourage negotiations to make sure that the local context is uh, uh, brought on board as much as possible to inform uh, the decisions that are being made uh, especially between any deal that is being made uh, between um, the african and the eu Samira, you wanted to come in on this topic as well? Yeah, so for me, is uh, I want just to, to give a few uh, additional points here. We need uh, to offer opportunity for smallholder farmers in agriculture. We need to make the agriculture in Africa attractive for the young. So for for that, and we, we, we listened to the, the video in the beginning of the, this, uh, this event that uh, smallholder um, uh, farmers from um, uh, parts of Africa, she said that she needs for that to access to the tools that will help us to be more resilient and competitive and therefore to increase here uh, yield production and uh, be competitive and have access to uh, to the market. So again, here we need to offer a such opportunity to smallholder farmers. The partnership uh, has uh, to include the the the, 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 over, uh, the specificity of the, the environment in Africa. An impact assessment of the proposal uh, policy should be conducted before uh, to uh, any push and implementation of the green transition in Africa. So, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of my uh, intervention, so that policies suited for the need of one will not necessarily suited to the other than uh, uh, than other uh, continents. And uh, again, it just maybe one point which uh, I like each time to mention for women. Women, for me, in agriculture, it's a real the link between farm and table. So together under partnership, public provide partnership, we can really empower smallholder farms and give this opportunity to empower women presence in agriculture. This is very crucial to uh, support sustainable agriculture in Africa. Thank Great. You. Well, we're just we're just about out of time for today. But before we go, I wanted to get each of your concluding thoughts about what we've talked about today, uh, and kind of your key takeaways from the discussion. But I'd like you to kind of use as a guide for your concluding remarks this final question from the audience, which comes from Nicholas Cockleman. Uh, he says, "On a global scale, we produce enough food to feed all humans." How can the EU-AU partnership promote the proper distribution of resources? So just a question to kind of guide your final thoughts here. John, let's start with you. Uh, what are your concluding thoughts from today's discussion? I think it's a very, very useful reminder that the, uh, the audience has given us that there is enough food uh, to feed the world. And um, you know, the, the, the Malthus um, vision has not come true ever. And uh, there, is, there is also capacity to feed the world uh, as the population grows in the future. Um, the problem is not the, uh, that, it's, it's, it's uh, poverty and lack of access. And when it comes to Africa in particular, very low levels of productivity. And the, our, our biggest objective uh, for the uh, future partnership between Africa and Europe is to increase the productivity and production of African agriculture in a sustainable way so that it becomes less import dependent, becomes more resilient and becomes uh, more able to feed 
not only the African population, but um, other parts of the world. Thanks very much. Joachim, let's go to you next for your concluding thoughts. Yes, I think it's of utmost importance uh, uh, that we can guarantee food security for all uh, people uh, in Europe as well as in Africa. Uh, and there, I think uh, agri-food partnerships could uh, play an important role, but it's not only the question of such a partnership. It's also a question uh, of uh, accompanying politics like trade policy, because uh, sometimes uh, the problems are caused uh, uh, of trade. Uh, uh, and it uh, will be more important in the future, because especially in uh, huge African regions, we have an, uh, uh, we see what uh, climate change uh, has for, uh, which consequences uh, climate change has. And therefore, it's uh, very important that we stick together to uh, fi tackle climate change, because otherwise uh, 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 the consequences of the climate change often are uh, uh, the reasons uh, for uh, military conflicts. We have uh, 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 such uh, uh, root causes uh, for conflicts, uh, for example, we can see it in the Sahel zone. And therefore, uh, it's uh, of utmost importance that we work together on uh, food, uh, on, uh, food security and food partnerships could be a, a, chance, if, a chance if we do it in the right way. Thank you. Thanks very much. Timothy, what are your concluding thoughts? Um, I think uh, I like the reminder that we produce enough food for all and actually uh, food security, you know, is a function of both availability and access. Uh, for availability, we must be able to produce enough, and then for access, of course, we should be able to afford that food. Uh, at the back of our minds, uh, and what we need to 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 to, to kind of uh, remember, even as we discuss all this, is that uh, when it comes to Africa, and I can give an example of Kenya. Um, majority of the people actually rely uh, on, on, on agriculture, not just for food, but for income as well. So even if they're not producing enough and uh, we can actually import, uh, but then that also creates a question of whether they can actually afford that food. Um, so even as we discuss some of these deals and we, as you're looking at uh, the effects they are likely to have in terms of what uh, the EU uh, and AU partnership is likely to generate, uh, we must ensure that uh, you know, farmers in Kenya or in Africa as well, they either, you know, make, uh, enable them to either produce more so that it's actually available to them, or, you know, they actually are able to generate more income from their enterprises uh, so that they're actually able to afford the food that, uh, uh, you know, that is able to, I mean, they, they being traded. But more importantly is also that um, for us, uh, we have to continue to, work around combating uh, the effects of climate change. I think we all agree that that, that is to be a priority. And uh, of course, you know, trade facilitated, trade in agriculture and agricultural commodities is, is, is key, especially given that uh, most of uh, uh, Africa, you know, relies heavily on agriculture. So, you know, investments in, uh, in ensuring that, you know, we can actually facilitate trade uh, better, you know, will actually allow us to come up with more sustainable solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Timothy. David, what are your final thoughts from today's conversation? Thank you. I found, the, I found this conversation very enlightening. And uh, in my conclusion or parting remarks, uh, I would like to say that, that um, uh, one aspect, or the biggest aspect in uh, production is uh, uh, production per unit area. What I've seen in Kenya is um, the experience I have around this country is that the, the production per unit area of whatever you talk about is very low. We are not able to, to meet the required target, and mostly the farmers go without any target at all. So what happens is that uh, when the yields are out, you find the farmer has produced at a very high cost, but he cannot be able to sell competitively at the market, which is, leads to loss making. And also the product or the food becomes very expensive to the consumers. What uh, EU, because this is a partnership, and a partner, you, when you are partnering with somebody, you look at the weaknesses, and then you build on those weaknesses to become strengths. So one of the things that EU needs to focus on is 
Africa, how they can make it sustainable. Also, is to first of all is to make the farmers willing to produce by taking or looking at the limiting factors that are affecting production, especially which that are causing that low production by this area. Thank you. Thanks, David. And finally, Samira, what are your concluding thoughts from today's discussion? So thank you very much, Dave, and thank you very much for this uh, rich interaction. So to summarize uh, all these points, so for me to achieve a green transition in Africa, need a partnership that improve access to sustainable synthetic and organic pesticide, improve access to training, improve access to finance, and enable improved market access between the both continents. So Africa, and it was mentioned all the many times during the discussion, need to grow a local business and not just opportunity to import from Europe. So Africa is the most vulnerable part of the world to climate change. And that this is all make use of agricultural technologies even more critical in Africa. For example, the maize is stable crop in Africa for food security and their food. Farmers in Europe produce more than four times per hectare than farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. So we are uh, striving to help farmers produce more food in a sustainable way. And we are uh, ready as an industry to support um, a partnership that can support a localized a green transition in agriculture. So to conclude, so our motto as Crop Life Africa Middle East is partner in sustainable agriculture. And we are really looking forward to the new Europe Africa partnership ended by a partnership that support uh, our uh, localized green transition in agriculture to our continents. Thank you very much. Thanks, Samira. So certainly there will be a lot to watch when we have the EU-AU summit here in Brussels this week on Thursday and Friday, uh, particularly when it comes to agriculture, because as we've heard in today's panel, this is a really key area for cooperation between Europe and Africa. And there are a lot of live issues here uh, with new developments in terms of trade, new developments in terms of technology, and new developments in terms of sustainability expectations. All of that is going to be discussed at the highest of levels when uh, the heads of state and government come here to Brussels later this week. So we'll see what they have to say about these issues we've been talking about today. I want to thank our panelists for some great insights and also to you at home in the audience for asking some great questions. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us and I wish you an excellent rest of the day. We'll see you right here for the next Your Active Debate. Take care.